you know, music is all about passion. With PB, we've been in business now since 1965, and the passion is still there. We've been very fortunate to evolve under the same ownership and management. We have amassed all this experience, and experience sometimes doesn't teach you what to do, but it kind of teaches you what not to do. I had the good fortune to uh, grow up in kind of a, a magical time back when this thing we call rock and roll first started. I mean, if you look at where all this came from, it came from Mississippi and Louisiana, kind of along the banks of the Mississippi River from New Orleans up to St. Louis. And my dad was a, uh, my dad was a musician back in the 30s, and he started a music store with $50 and a secondhand piano. And my dad was a typical small town retailer, hated rock and roll, said it would never last. And, in 1957, uh, I went to a Bo Diddley concert in uh, Laurel, Mississippi, and I got just carried away with being a guitar player, so I went back and told my dad that I wanted to play guitar, and he said, well, son, you don't want to play guitar because this, this rock and roll will never last. It's, it's, it's no good. Well, of course, that just made me want to do it more, so for the next eight years, I went around trying to be a guitar player, and I did manage to get in a few little bands, but. An interesting thing happened. Every band I got in, they needed gear. And when I was in high school, I took every shop course I could. I had machine shop, I had uh, basic electricity, advanced electricity. And if I could run a lathe, a milling machine, a metal shaper, surface grinder, and if somebody wanted a tremolo mechanism, give me a block of brass or aluminum or steel in a couple of hours. And so easy for me, I thought everybody knew how to do it. So. On the way, I did find out what I am talented at, it's building things. I've always been able to build things, and looking back, I used to win science fairs, I used to win model airplane contests, and it certainly wasn't because I was smart, it was because I was good at building things with my hands. I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, well, it looks like you're not gonna be a rock star, so what do you wanna do with the rest of your life? And well, you know, I love music and I love musicians, and I'm gonna do what every musician I ever knew at that time said, and they said, I wish somebody would build good gear at a fair price. Uh, when music started out back in the 50s, um, rock and roll exploded. And in that time, most of the music manufacturing companies were owned by families. That's when Bill Ludwig and his family owned Ludwig Drums, and Leo Fender actually owned Fender. And about all this time that the Brits were very impressed with rock and roll music and they kind of repackaged it and sold it back to us in the form of the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the whole thing that we call the British Invasion. Music exploded again. But this time it was in the golden age of the conglomerates and this was the time that I entered the business because I was approaching things from a technician. And everybody said, well, no, you're crazy. You can't do this. You, you can't compete with this company. But as time has proven, that's not the case. I started out making tube amps, and I went into solid state amps, and then I went into sound reinforcement, making power amplifiers. We even make our own loudspeakers. Over those 43 years, we have earned somewhere north of 180 patents. The younger people today think that tube technology is magic, and it's not magic. As a matter of fact, I've been in this business literally all my life, and I've run into some craftsmanship, some art, but never one time have I ever discovered a piece of magic. You know, it's, a, it's about sound, it's about feel, it's about uh, emotion. We're modeling tube amps, not just how they sound, like you put a microphone in front of them, but actually how they respond and how they feel. Our Viper amplifiers are that way, and in the Viper we, we use a, a very interesting combination of analog technology and digital technology. We call it appropriate technology because quite honestly, to get the effect, I could care less whether it's analog or digital. I'm looking for the best sound. And the Revolver software, I believe, represents the future because for the first time, a player can actually go in and design his own amplifier. Nobody's ever been able to do that before. There are a number of people that do modeling amplifiers and modeling software, but we're the only people that do modeling software that actually do valve amplifiers. And when I decided to get in the guitar business, 
uh, in the mid 70s, I wanted to do it a different way. I've always been fascinated with the fit and finish of, of rifles. You can't put a piece of paper between the metal and the wood and those things were mass produced. And I said, well, you know, whatever machine makes those rifle stocks with that precision, I can make guitar necks that way. So I did a little research and found out it was called a copy lay. They didn't make them in this country, they made in Europe. So I went over there and bought one. And I bought a, a computer controlled uh, a router profiler. We were making precision guitar parts. But you take a pile of precision guitar parts cut to less than a thousandth of, of an inch, and one man in one uh, eight hour shift could produce well over 200 guitars. We've expanded even outside the music business. We, we have a division called Media Matrix. It's a huge digital uh, audio networking system. Every theme park, almost every casino, the United States Senate, the United States House of Representatives, that system is built on our Media Matrix digital software. We have engineering teams literally all over the, all over the globe. And you know, I, I have the opinion that most all of us are born with a set of abilities or talents or proclivities or whatever you want to call them. The trick in life is to find out what they are and then go for it. A lot of people are, are doing things that they kind of want to do, but they're not good at it. You got to find out what you're good at it and then go for it. I tried to take the talent that I was given and make the most of it. As human beings, the very best we can ever hope to do is to make a difference, hopefully for the better. What turns me on the most is actually getting my hands dirty and getting in a, getting in a lab and working, sometimes vicariously through our engineering folks and uh, just being a part of it. It's, it's, it's a very exciting thing to, to be a part of this, this, this living, breathing, creative thing that we call PV. I'm willing to try new and different things. I encourage my people to, to be creative. Part of my job is to provide the, the organization, the infrastructure, if you will, to support those ideas. Because, you know, frankly, I don't care if it's my idea or somebody else's idea, as long as we can use those ideas to make a better product. The guy whose name's on the door is still there, still calling the shots, and uh, simply put, he gives a damn. And that's why, we have been able to survive, but the best is yet to come.